Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I try today to learn something new. Each day I want to learn something new because I'm very, very old and will be dead soon. <laughs> so I want to be as well informed as I can possibly be when I die. And I, listening to the Flemish language today, I realize why it is called Flemish and that is because it is the best language ever invented anywhere in the world for disposing of phlegm. <laughs> when I went to Cambridge and joined a club called the Footlights, which produced a show at the end of each year in the local Cambridge professional theatre, you know, sketches and songs and this kind of thing, when I suddenly discovered that I could sit down with a blank sheet of paper and two hours later I could have written something that then made people laugh. This was an extraordinary moment for me. And I thought, my goodness, I am creative. So because I had been brought up as a scientist, I got into Cambridge on science, I started observing what was going on when I was creating. And for example, the first thing that I noticed is that if I was trying to write a sketch at night, and I got stuck, or I couldn't think of an ending, or I couldn't see how to continue the sketch, I would go to bed. And when I woke up in the morning and made myself a cup of coffee and went back to my desk and looked at the problem, not only was the solution to this problem immediately apparent to me, but I couldn't even remember what the problem had been the previous night. I couldn't understand why I did not see what the solution was. So I began to realize that this business of sleeping on a problem, as we say in the English language, and I think you have a very similar phrase, the idea of working at something, thinking about something, going to bed and then waking up with a solution, was absolutely extraordinary. And that is actually the key to what I'm talking to you about today. Now, this business of coming to a, a solution overnight without thinking about it. The next extraordinary experience I had is I wrote a script, and I like this script very, very much. And because I've always been a bit disorganized, I lost it. And I couldn't find it anywhere. And I was pretty disappointed, but I sat down and I forced myself to rewrite it from memory. And it didn't take terribly long, and then I found the original. And fortunately, I was curious enough to compare the two. And what I discovered was, the one that I had rewritten from memory was noticeably better than the original that I'd lost. And I realized that the explanation for this was that after I'd finished writing the original, my unconscious part of my mind, my unconscious, must have continued working on it, even though I was not aware that that was what was happening, with the result that when I came to write it out again, it was better. Because why else would it have been better? Particularly as I wrote it out the second time, much faster. So I began to see that there was something going on, that there was a part of my mind that was helping me be much more creative. And the next thing that I noticed was that the most dangerous thing when I was trying to write anything was to be interrupted. Because the flow of thought that I had was not immediately picked up after the interruption. It took me a very long time. Now, if I was writing something that was relatively straightforward, like a monologue, it was easier to pick it up. What I discovered later on, writing Faulty Towers, where as I was imagining a situation I was having to carry in my mind the emotional states of all the people, taking part in that scene, that I noticed that interruptions were much more destructive. So the key to getting in a creative state is to avoid interruptions.
Now, people often say to me, where do you get your ideas from? And I say, I get them from a Mr. Ken Levinshaw who lives in Swindon. He sends them to me every Monday morning on a postcard. And I say, I once asked Ken where he gets his ideas from, and he gets them from a lady called Mildred Spong who lives on the Isle of Wight. But um, he once asked Mildred Spong where she got her ideas from, and she refused to say. So the point is, we don't know. This is terribly important. We don't know where we get our ideas from. What we do know is we do not get them from our laptop. In fact, as I was indicating to you by the recounting my earliest experiences, we get our ideas from what I'm going to call for a moment our unconscious, the part of our mind that goes on working, for example, when we're asleep. So what I'm saying is that if you get into the right mood, then your mode of thinking will become much more creative. But if you're racing around all day, ticking things off on lists, looking at your watch, making phone calls, and generally just keeping all the balls in the air, you are not going to have any creative ideas. So now I want to run very quickly over how in this sort of frenzied world that we all live in, how you can create a mood that will enable you to be more creative. And basically, the way I put it is that you need to create a tortoise enclosure so that your little tortoise mind can, it's a little nervous creature, just look around and then think, yes, it's safe to come out. And to do this, you have to create a kind of oasis in your life in the middle of the stressed, oh, I've got to do this, I've forgotten to do that, I have to be there by 11. In the middle of all of that, you have to create an oasis, a tortoise enclosure where your tortoise mind can come out to play. And there's two things you have to do. You have to create boundaries of space and you have to create boundaries of time. It's as simple as that. So boundaries of space simply means you create boundaries to avoid the interruptions that I was talking about earlier, which is so disastrous to the creative process. So, if you're a fat cat at the top of an organization, you say to your lovely assistant, please, I am now going to think, do not um, interrupt me unless the building is burning down for an hour and a quarter. And if you're at the bottom of the hierarchy, maybe you just go out into the park with an umbrella if you're in Belgium. And you just sit there quietly where you are not going to be interrupted. But you create boundaries of space. So what you have to do when you've created boundaries of space where you're not going to be interrupted is you have to give yourself a starting time and a finish time. Because when you do that, you've created an oasis that is separate from ordinary life, and then, and only then, can you play. Boundaries of space, boundaries of time. It's as simple as that. To know how good you are at something requires the same skills as it does to be good at that thing. Which means if you're absolutely hopeless at something, you lack exactly the skills that you need to know that you're absolutely hopeless at it. And this is a profound discovery. That most people who have absolutely no idea what they're doing have absolutely no idea that they have no idea what they're doing. It explains a great deal of life. It explains particularly Hollywood. <laughs> but it also explains why so many people in charge of so many organizations have no idea what they're doing. They have a terrible blind spot. And the problem with the teachers may be that the teachers do not realize that they themselves are not very creative 
and therefore they may not value creativity even if they can recognize it. If the people in charge are very egotistical, then they want to take credit for everything that happens and they want to feel that they are in control of everything that happens and that means consciously or unconsciously they will discourage creativity in other people.